this video, we're going to start looking at empirical system modeling from the step response. In previous videos, we've looked at how to find control gains by guess and test. We set the control gains to be some values, and then we run the system and we watch the response. Knowing the general effect of making the control gains bigger or smaller, we then change the gains and test the system again. In some control situations, we can't use this approach because the consequences of picking bad control gains are too extreme to allow us to do a guess and test approach. In these cases, we can use the approach of first creating a model of our system and then figuring out control gains by simulating the system. There are two basic approaches to creating a system model. One is the analytic approach, and the other is the empirical approach. The analytic approach is the approach where we use fundamental laws, like Newton's laws or Kirchhoff's law, in order to obtain equations that relate the input to the output signal of our system. In the empirical approach, we're also looking for an equation that relates the input to the output. But in this case, we get those equations not from derivations from fundamental laws, but from data collected by doing experiments on our system. Today, we're going to be looking at the empirical approach. And specifically, we're going to be getting our information from the step response that we collect from our system. In creating a system model, the first step is to figure out the system order. The order of a system refers to the highest derivative in the system equation. Almost all of the systems you'll encounter can be sufficiently approximated as either a first order system, a second order system, or a third order system. Once you know the order of the system, you also have a basic form of the differential equation that describes that system. A first order system equation looks like this. In this equation, x of t is the system output signal, and u of t is the system input signal. Notice that the first time derivative of the output signal, x dot of t, also appears in this equation. But the second derivative does not appear. That's why this is called a first order system. The first derivative of the output signal appears, but the second derivative and higher derivatives do not. In this equation, there are two constants. Tau, which is known as the time constant, and g, which is known as the system gain. If you can find values for tau and g, you would have an equation that models your first order system. Now, suppose your system is instead a second order system. A second order system equation looks like this. Here, x of t is the output signal and u of t is the input signal, just like it was for the first order system. Notice that in this equation, we have the second derivative of x of t. That's why this is called a second order system. In this equation, there are three constants. The damping ratio, zeta, the natural frequency, omega n, and the gain, g. If we could find values for g, omega n, and zeta, we would have a complete model of our system, which tells us the relationship between the input signal and the output signal. Lastly, let's look at the equation for a third order system. The equation for a third order system looks just like the equation for a second order system, except we have one additional derivative on the input, on the output signal x of t. So here also, we only have three constants, the damping ratio zeta, 
the natural frequency omega n and the gain g. If we could find values for these three constants, we would have a complete model for our third order system. When we have a system in front of us, for example, the motor with the rack and pinion like we have from our kit, and we're trying to find a model for this system, our first step is to figure out which order our system is. Is it a first order, second order, or third order system? Today, we're going to be looking at how we can make this determination from the time response. You've already captured a time response from your system, so you have some data that you can look at. We're going to take a look at a couple of characteristic step responses. A step response is how the system responds in time to an input that is a step. A step input is an input that changes suddenly from one value to another value. For example, suppose I have a time plot here and this is the input value. And suppose that the input is zero for some time, and then it suddenly jumps up to another value. This is a step input. A step input is what you get if your input is on a switch and you suddenly turn the switch on. Or in your code, if we are commanding the motor to go zero RPM, and then we suddenly command it to go some non-zero RPM, and then hold that one non-zero RPM constant for a while, that would be a step input. Or if we're trying to get the rack and pinion to go to a particular position, and position is our input, if we suddenly command the rack and pinion to go to a particular target position, like 1000 or 2000, as we did in our code, this is also a step input. So when we did our tests in our proportional control videos, we were doing step responses. Now, let's take a look at some characteristic step responses for first, second, and third order systems. I'm going to start out by showing you some of these characteristic responses, and then we'll talk about the differences between them. Here I'm showing you the characteristic step response for a first order system. Here I'm showing you two different characteristic step responses for a second order system. And here I'm showing you a characteristic step response for a third order system. Now let's go back and look at each of these individually and look at the differences between them. First, let's compare a first order response to a second order response. This plot over here has overshoot. It oscillates around the target point for a while before coming to a stop. This is characteristic of a second order system. If you have this kind of a response that has overshoot and oscillations, then your system is a second order system. First order systems do not ever overshoot or oscillate around their target point. Now, suppose that you get a step response that looks more like this one up here. This response looks very similar to the first order step response. How could we tell the difference between a first and second order step response when the response looks like this? There are two ways we can tell this. First is by looking at the slope of the response at time equals zero, that is the time at which the response starts. In a first order step response, the slope here when the response starts is at its maximum. But in the second order system, the slope when the response first starts is at its minimum. The slope starts being zero. Here's another related way to tell the difference between the first and second order response. In the first order response, the curvature of the response is the same always. 
In the second order response, the curvature switches. In other words, there's an inflection point about halfway along the response. If you find this kind of an inflection point, then you know that your system is a second order response. If the curvature is the same all the way along the response, then it's probably a first order. Now, let's look again at the third order step response. Identifying a third order step response is pretty easy. It just looks like a ramp. The slope of this response will be constant and it won't settle on a point at all. Once we've decided which order our system is by looking at the step response, we can now move on to finding values for the constants. That's the other part of information we need in order to complete our model. Let's suppose that we've identified our system as a first order response. In that case, we know that the system equation is going to look like this. In order to complete this model, all we need to do is find a value for tau and find a value for the gain, g. Let's start by looking at how to find a value for the gain, g. The gain, g, is defined as the steady state output value divided by the input. So, for example, let's suppose that we saw a step response that looks like this. Here, the steady state output value is 2. This by itself doesn't tell us what the gain is because we need to also know what the input was. If the input value was also 2, then the gain of this system would be g equals 1. But if the input of this system was 1, then the gain of this system would be 2, g equals 2. Next, let's look at how we find the value of the time constant tau. Here, we're going to look at the slope of the response at time equals zero, that is the time at which the response starts. Remember we said earlier that this is where the response has the maximum slope. We'll extend this slope up in a straight line until this line intersects the steady state value, the steady state output of the response. Then, the place where these two lines intersect, I will drop down and look at what time this intersection occurs. This amount of time between where the response started and where these two lines intersect is tau, the time constant, in units of seconds. Once I know the gain, which is unitless, and tau, the time constant, in seconds, I just plug those values into this equation and I have my model. Now, let's look at how we find the values for the constants for a second order system. Here, we have three constants to find zeta, the damping ratio, omega n, the natural frequency, which is in units of radians per second, and the gain, g. The gain we find in the same way that we did this for the first order system. We take the steady state value of the output and we divide it by the input value, and that gives us our gain. Next, let's look at how we could find the value of zeta, the damping ratio. We can find this from the overshoot using this equation. The overshoot is equal to e to the negative pi times zeta over the square root of 1 minus zeta squared. Let's do an example. This example here is showing an overshoot of an amount that is about 22. Here's how we got that value. The first peak occurs at approximately 82, and the steady state value of this response is about 60. So 82 minus 60 is 22. That's our overshoot.
But in this equation, OS is not just the amount of overshoot. We need to give it as a fraction. So we're going to take that 22 amount and divide it by the steady state value, which is 60. OS in this equation will be 22 over 60. I now take the natural log of both sides of this equation in order to get rid of the E. Next, I'll square both sides of the equation to get rid of the square root in the denominator on the right. Next, I'll multiply both sides of the equation by 1 minus zeta squared. Now, I'll gather the zeta squareds together on one side of the equation. So I'll add 1.0066 zeta squared to both sides of this equation. Next, I'll get zeta squared by itself by dividing both sides of the equation by 10.8762. Lastly, I'll take this square root of both sides of the equation. Zeta cannot be negative, so I'll take only the positive solution. And I get zeta is equal to 0 0.304. That seems right, because we know that a critically damped system occurs when zeta is equal to 1. An underdamped system like this, which has lots of oscillations, should have a zeta value that's significantly less than 1. So 0.3 is a reasonable value to find for zeta. So far, we've found values for the gain, g, and for zeta, the damping ratio. Lastly, we need a value for omega n, the natural frequency. We can get that by looking at the peak time. The peak time is the amount of time between the start of the response and the first peak. If we know the peak time and we've also already found zeta, we can find omega n using this equation. Tp is the peak time, omega n is the natural frequency in radians per second, and zeta is the damping ratio, which we've already found. Going back to this step response, which we've been using as an example today, we can estimate the peak time as being about 0.7 seconds. I'm going to plug that in along with the zeta value we already found. I'm going to start by expanding the value inside of this square root. Next, I'll multiply both sides by 0.9526 omega n. Now finally, I divide by 0.667 to get omega n. So here I get the value of omega n in units of radians per second. Now that I've found zeta, omega n, and the gain g, I can plug these values back into the equation for the second order system to get my complete model. So the final model looks something like this. I can simplify this a little bit by actually calculating out these values. I could now use this model to design control gains for my system. In the next video, we'll be looking at how to do that. But for now, we're going to stop here with our system identified and modeled. You'll notice that we didn't yet look at the case where we have an overdamped second order response. That is, a second order response that is almost indistinguishable from a first order response because it doesn't have any overshoot. We also didn't look at how to model a third order response. That's because these two cases are much more easily modeled from the frequency response rather than from the time response, the step response, that we looked at today. Next time, we'll be looking at this frequency response and learning how to deal with these other two cases, as well as learning how to find control gains given our model. For the lab portion of today, I want you to try and take this step response that you collected from your rack and pinion system with kp equal to some value that gives you overshoot, and see if you can find the zeta, omega n, and gain g values from your step response. That's what you'll be showing me in the lab submission for today.